Hello, everybody. Welcome in. As you are connecting your audios via Zoom, and we're kind of introducing ourselves, uh, I, I want to uh, kind of get started on, on this session. So if you're on the right presentation, you're on the presentation that says drawing a line from the AIDS crisis to the present with uh, our presenter here, Anna L. Elden Brady. Uh, and I'm going to be introducing Anna um, in, in a minute real quick. Uh, but I do want to take a, a, a moment to remember, remind everybody about our expectations, about how we should be conducting each, ourselves here. And in the same setting, the chat is currently working. I will be putting on a link for the Discord as well. So if you have any questions that you want to ask that you want to kind of follow up later on as well, um, I would highly recommend that you go on to the link that I will be placing very, very soon. Uh, again, uh, Zoom chats kind of come and go. Uh, once the presentation is gone, so is the so are the questions and all the conversations that are going on there. So we encourage everybody to hop over to Discord and get their get the uh, link for that. So I'll be putting that on right now. That's on your Zoom chat, uh, and then uh, you, you're welcome to respond on chat as well. Um, encouraging words are also really uh, appreciated, I'm sure. Um, so it is my honor to present uh, my friend here, uh, Anna L. Elden Brady, Z pronouns Zizer, uh, has worked in Michigan State University in the past, creating professional development opportunities and finding support for the grantees on the National Mentoring Program. Z lives in a temperamental, on the temperamental shores of Lake Michigan in Muskegon, Michigan, uh, with their two wild-hearted children, four cats, and a partner. Z runs a small nonprofit aimed at creating mutual aid opportunities and creative outlets for Zer community in a neighborhood that has somewhere around the edges. Z loves fantasy, funky earrings, fandom, and fluidly fabulous fashion. Take it from here. That's an also alliteration, as you can tell in that uh, bio. <laughs> So hello, y'all, um, and thank you, Danny, for that lovely introduction. Today, we are going to be talking AIDS history and how that reverberates up to the present. I'm going to share my screen. We are going to hope that it does what it's supposed to. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that all goes well there. So currently, you should be seeing my uh, title screen. Hope that it's doing that for you. Um, so just going to toss out there. I know that in this room, we have folks from across generations. Uh, some of us have probably learned about the AIDS crisis in different ways and in different settings. Um, some folks lived through it uh, as part of their adult or formative years. I was a wee mite and it um, kind of the echoes of it shaped my childhood, but it wasn't something that was you know very present, particularly for me. So I want to just kind of think of that as the context as we go through that this is going to be looked at from someone who I'm looking at it as a historian who has seen the ripple and looking back and seeing how its fingerprints have been left on culture, even though I myself am too young to have actually remembered it actively in the place that I was uh, growing up at the time. So. I didn't really realize what was lost in the AIDS crisis until well into my adulthood. I'd heard of AIDS, of course. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and even in my sheltered agricultural community south of Lansing, Michigan, I heard a little about it. And being a theater kid, it was impossible to escape the draw of rent once I was in high school. Uh, the staying power of that musical alone is a ripple to our present. Uh, how many of you can identify Seasons of Love by the first few notes alone? I know I can. You hit that piano, boom, I'm there and I'm singing with you. Other than um, like, and, and you can also see, uh, sorry, the middle the middle picture there, uh, the top is actually an image from Rent. The bottom image of a young man in the, in the blue and maroon sweater is a friend of mine dressed exactly like the lead from Rent. So again, you can see that that ripple was very present despite the fact that the actual content of, of Rent was far removed from us. So other than sex ed in high school and, and middle school, basically being that, you know, if you had intimate relations, anyone, you would probably get an STD and it would might be AIDS and then you'd die because, of course, this was the 90s fear tactic of it was present. I didn't really have a context for this disease or even this show. What little I did know really anchored it uh, pretty firmly in being something bad or dirty and awful. And the biggest problem of people who used uh, intravenous drugs or gay men or those who had sex with gay men. 
Uh, I really didn't start to learn much about AIDS and the gay community until I started to research, thanks to Rent. I expanded my knowledge a bit beyond that, but I wasn't really digging into it uh, until I saw the documentary, How to Survive a Plague. And that's when it really hit me just how intense activism was and how urgent the movement had been and how much more I had to learn. So I came out as bi in 2005 uh, or so-ish. And that's when I realized that I knew way too damn little about the community history around me and that I wasn't connected to it. And I wasn't connected to this past other than in the context of a musical. I also realized I knew only a handful of gay elders. I could count them on one hand. I could point to people in my family and community and life who'd lived through D-Day, who'd been in Vietnam, people who'd been in peace protests and walkouts. I knew people who'd been uh, part of labor movements, who'd been punks and hippies, but I knew almost nobody of any sort as an adult in the LGBTQIA plus community, uh, even close to into my thirties. Some I knew in real life, the few that I did know, uh, and a few more I'd met online, but either way, I realized there was a gulf in community narrative. I didn't know my queer elders, and I was going to have to learn these stories on my own. Fast forward to somewhere around 2016. I had a toddler, a kindergartner, and my family situation was changing. Um, but as it's doing this, I was also getting to know my now ex-husband's great uncle Jim and his partner Ken. That's uh, the man in the leather jacket and the open front shirt in the bottom. Well, that's, that's a picture of Jim many moons ago. Jim was the first gay elder I really knew in the family, and he was a storyteller and a man who delighted in talking about the bright and adventurous life that he had led. And by adventurous, I mean he was a leatherman in the 70s out of Market Street in the Castro in San Francisco. And then he was an historian with the Chicago Public Library. And he had so many other incredible cool things that he did with his life. He was a, a photographer. Um, he ran in some artistic and, and uh, photography circles in San Francisco with names that are rather legendary. Um, and I've only started to really realize just how much of a figure he was in those circles. Um, but he also wrote a book. He wrote a book, and I have a copy of it, and I love it dearly, Old Street Blues. Um, and this was where I realized that thanks to AIDS, we'd lost significant queer subcultures to the crisis, not just people in their stories, but entire ways of being in our community. And until I read it, I really didn't know anything about the leather community at all in the 70s or how some gay men lived their lives before AIDS or how they would react to it once it was here. So few of them are able to tell those stories and those who died, a lot of them didn't leave behind families who were willing to share that part of those lives, even if they knew them. So that gives you a little bit of context about how I'm starting off looking at this as a ripple. So I'm going to actually read you a passage from this book that kind of gives an illustration of something I wasn't aware of. And that was how these, how AIDS kind of showed up in these communities and how it, how people reacted to it. Because again, this is part of that rippling forward and part of where we see gaps in that, um, that community knowledge. So. The story is set at Phoebe's, which was a rather famous gay leather bar in the Castro, one of the many um, in the area and, and that are no longer in existence. So Henry, an all-American boy from Wisconsin, came into Phoebe's one afternoon as I sat nursing a scotch on the rocks. Have you seen this? He said as he held out a copy of the Bay Area Reporter. He was shaking the weekly bar rag so much for emphasis that nobody could possibly have read what he was pointing to. It's lifted from a New York gay rag. It says right here. Gay pneumonia is hitting the New York community. Have you heard of this? Gay pneumonia? He looked first at the bartender who had come up to take his order and then at me, then back again. The bartender shook his head and raised his eyebrows at Henry. Oh, draft, Henry said to the bartender. Gay pneumonia, how could there be such a thing? Pneumonia can't know if you're gay or not, I said. It says right here, gay pneumonia, Henry said as he stabbed his thick forefinger at the weekly issue of the Bay Area Reporter. There was an article last week on gay cancer. I thought the same thing, the bartender said as he set down Henry's beer. How can cancer know if you're gay or not? He glanced at me. Another, he said as he looked at my empty glass. I nodded. Let me see that, I said to Henry. Where are they getting this from anyway? The bartender set down my fresh scotch on the rocks and returned to washing glasses. So later, Jim talks about returning to the bar a week after. Henry was at Phoebe's. By the time I sat down at the bar, there was a scotch on the rocks waiting for me. 
Remember that article on gay cancer that was in the, that was in the bar last week, Henry said? Who could forget, the bartender said. He lit my cigarette. I tipped well. Well, there's more to it than we thought, Henry said. He lit his own cigarette. I sipped my scotch. The mainline press has picked up on it. Gay pneumonia turns out to be something called pneumocystis pneumonia, and gay cancer is something called, called Kaposi sarcoma. Cancer and pneumonia can't know somebody's gay, I said. Well, health officials seem to think so. They're lumping the two together and calling it GRID. GRID, I, I said. What's that mean? Gay-related immune deficiency. Henry signaled for another round of drinks. The bartender obliged. So I like to kind of look at that because it's showing a very real human reaction to the news of this. Um, Jim wrote also in the book that a week later, a roommate of a friend found a suspicious spot on his chest, the first essentially that he had seen of this um, sarcoma. So first, a lot of first one of the reasons I like to to refer to Jim's book is a lot of those of us who are younger don't really hear that firsthand narrative from people who lived it that often, and this is one way that I can capture that. It wasn't something that was understood going in. People didn't believe what was happening. They didn't believe it could be true. As science learned a little more at a time, well, there were blunders, like calling it GRID, which entrenched homophobia that would accompany the public health response and coupling the disease with homosexuality in a way we still really had shaken off. Um, the lack of understanding and the biased nomenclature is strikingly familiar to the Wuhan flu nomenclature and, and conversation that hit in 2020. Um, so we kind of see how this ripple of how science coming um, into the public light and not understanding and people grappling with what's happening uh, is, is very similar. So you may also kind of remember that when COVID did hit, one of the first things that happened, uh, one of the first shutdowns was the Pride Festivals. And again, we're gonna look at that as one of those little drops, those little ripples where the community that had been through a plague already looked at what was happening and said, we're not going through that again. So I don't really want to dwell too much on the whole loss of AIDS, but we, it's really um, inescapable to go into some of the heavy statistics just to kind of set the stage, especially if there are some of y'all here who didn't learn about it until you were older. Um, I'm not going to assume that anybody had the chance and more so than I did to really learn about the impact of the crisis. When I tell you that I was in my 30s, when I started really getting into and learning about what this history looked like, um, it's probably going to be helpful if I tell you that I'm turning 39 this summer. So hasn't been all that long. So just to establish the backdrop, in the USA, by 1995, one gay man in nine had been diagnosed with AIDS, one in 15 had died, and 10% of the 1,600,000 men aged 25 to 44 who identified as gay had died, which is a literal decimation, which means a cutting out of a tenth of this cohort of gay men born from 51 to 70. Um, AIDS killed uh, 324,029 men and women in the U.S. between 87 and 98. For comparison, there were 404,000 combat-related deaths in the U.S. during World War II. In 1990, AIDS caused 61% of all deaths of men aged 25 to 44, so born between 46 and 65, in San Francisco, 35% in New York, 51% in Fort Lauderdale, 32% in Boston, 33% in D.C., 39% in Seattle, 34% in Dallas, 38% in Atlanta, 43% in Miami, and 25% in Portland, Oregon. So we're looking at this and seeing that it, the impact on the community and really kind of thinking about the mass scale of this. Um, it's something that I think is important to think about not because it's pretty, but because these are stories that are messy and we are losing as um, dies, those who are left who survived it, or they they haven't told you their stories and for oftentimes good reasons. But this is kind of one of these first ripples. We have a generation that depending on where they were, what they experienced, um, they could have and likely went through a tremendous loss and there was a lot of fear to one degree or another. And these stories are not out there. Language has changed, times have changed, um, and they might not even be heard if they are told or telling these stories because there are some interesting trends right now on um, our social media spaces with policing language. 
um, respectability politics showing up about how we talk about queerness. There's um, kind of an overly obsessive focus right now among certain subsets of young queer folk about making sure that everything is sanitized and family friendly. And that doesn't work necessarily when you're talking about the story of a sexually transmitted disease that killed thousands in just a few short years, often told by people who used to call themselves or still identify as faggots, dykes, and queers. Some who are bedecked in leather, carrying abrasive signs, or lab coats painted in fake blood. Those stories won't get heard if they're told, and if they are told, they may get shut down for not being polite or family friendly in their tone. So the ripple meets a wall, and the effect is that those who lived it feel silenced or unwelcome. And this leads into a conversation on the moral judgments against disease. So sexually transmitted infections have always been stigmatized in American culture because of the mainstream attitudes towards sex. With AIDS, it's shifted again and coupled with our homosexuality uh, and the um, shame that was coupled to homophobia. And of course, we see that in the way that the disease was initially named GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. It was named this because the initial speculation on causes were directly tied to promiscuity and the gay lifestyle. I put that in big old air quotes. There was um, a supposition that basically if you taxed the immune system enough by repeated sex, drugs, et cetera, partying, whatnot, um, you would push it to a point where it would break down. And that was one of those very, very early thoughts about where this might have come from, particularly with the fact that we were seeing pneumonias and cancers coming up. It was it didn't look like a unified virus. Um, and so therefore, the source of the disease was already being um, named as a judgment on those who had it before HIV was even pinpointed as the cause. So, of course, we end up with um, a lot of judgment on those who are being hospitalized. We started to see at that point, we saw people who were dying alone in the hospital. They were immediately quarantined when they came in because no one knew how it was being spread. Um, and it became clear early on that those who were infected and who were quarantined in the hospital were likely going to die alone sometimes with even their medical professionals afraid to touch them. This causes forth another ripple to our present, which is the distrust of the medical institution that we see in particularly some um, folk in our gay community, particularly gay men who may have been through this or have seen this um, happening to loved ones around them. So those who had AIDS were assumed to be gay men or drug users again, heavily stigmatized groups in the 80s. And we had backlash from the rising moral majority political voting block to both of these. Um, homosexuality was a big hot button uh, um, point at that point they were pushing back against, but also the war on drugs started with the Nixon administration also was playing in this. So again, we're looking at stigma and how it plays into how AIDS was viewed and how that moves forward to the future and to the present and how those with AIDS navigated this and how they interact with systems at present. So we have cultural rejection, we have political rejection, we have familiar rejection being very high as well. And we see a lot of people in the gay community, and I'm using that term expansively, who started to create means for mutual aid networks on their own. The community had always been a we have to depend on ourselves um, attitude, had always had that, and it really flourished under this because people were seeing this rejection even more sharply. They came to sit with the dying. They take uh, were taking care of those left behind. Folks pooled their money for wills. They fought landlords to keep bereaved partners in their homes. They helped each other with the basics for survival. And there were even those who would claim bodies no one wanted so they could then bury them. Um, as there was much fear and stigma surrounding all this, and there were community members and friends who ended up digging graves because those in the cemeteries refused to. So what I'm establishing here is that we have a source of collective community trauma. And like any traumas, um, that changes how a community interacts with the larger systems around it. So we're going to look now at all of the activism and the buildup that went through this and kind of look at how it pushes outward. In 1981, 80 men gathered uh, together with um, writer and activist Larry Kramer at his apartment, and they were there to address the gay cancer and to raise money for research. This informal meeting became the foundation of an organization that is still actually active today, Gay Men's Health Crisis. Um, it was officially founded the following year, and they set up an answering machine in the home of volunteer Roger McFarlane. He would later become the organization's first paid director, and that was the world's first AIDS hotline. 
It received over 100 calls the first night. In their first year, the organization published a newsletter advocating for people with AIDS. They opened their first office and they created their landmark buddy program to assist people with AIDS with day-to-day -day needs. So we're seeing again that, that buildup of mutual aid of community connections there of depending on themselves and not on outside um, organizations. The programming would continue to grow throughout the epidemic as they advocated for people with AIDS, educated the public and professionals, and raised funds for research programming and legal fees um, against discrimination suits uh, against organizations harming people with AIDS. And that's just a sliver. Um, and again, this group still is doing this work today. Throughout all this, the government in the United States is saying nothing. It takes President Reagan four years to even say AIDS in any public speech in 1985. So people are getting sick and dying in body all appearances. The U.S. government does not care. And we have um, images on the screen here of placards and posters that were carried by activists um, trying to draw attention to this. During this time, it is CDC Director James Mason who says, and uh, I quote, there are certain areas which, when the goals of science collide with moral and ethical judgment, science has to take a time out. So not only did it not appear that they didn't, or that it, did it appear they didn't care, some folks truly didn't. Now, 1985, right before Reagan had said anything publicly, we also have um, actor Rock Hudson falling very ill. Uh, this is the first major public figure that we start to see uh, decline due to AIDS-related diseases. He reached out to actually the Reagans because Ronald Reagan was an actor first and foremost before he got into politics. And um, he reached out to the Reagans for help. Hudson had flown to France for an experimental treatment that wasn't available in the US, collapsed at his hotel and was taken to an American hospital in Paris. He called the Reagans because there was, or rather his publicist did, because there was a military hospital in France where there was a doctor who treated him before. On the down low, no, he really wasn't supposed to, but his doctor had. Um, but Hudson couldn't be admitted to that hospital because he was not French. And his publicist called the Reagans to say, hey, can you pull some strings? Nancy Reagan said no. And eventually he did end up admitted, but he died in October, uh, less than a month after the president first said AIDS in public. This was the first high profile person who had died from AIDS related complications whose illness was openly acknowledged. So during this time too, we have other people talking to the government. It wasn't just Rock Hudson calling up and saying, hey Reagan, can we have some help? We also have um, doctors and activists. We have Dr. Marcus Conant, a clinical professor of dermatology um, emeritus at UC San Francisco. He was one of the first doctors to diagnose and treat AIDS. And he actually tried to advocate with the Reagan administration. The response was tepid at absolute best. Um, and he notes, uh, looking back, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States in more than just name. He represented the view of the, pre the, view of the majority of the American people. We're going to look the other way. If you say to me, what do I think of Ronald Reagan? Well, he was doing exactly what his constituents wanted him to do, look the other way. And he did it with great finesse. So again, the length of time it took for the Reagans to acknowledge AIDS is itself its own ripple forward. It shifts perception of a community on a presidency and on a culture. I will often hear in some circles, Ronald Reagan touted as some sort of stand-up citizen, a model president, a moral individual but that's not the perception of many within the LGBTQ community who have either studied this or who were um, observing in the trenches at the time and who were hearing these messages. Um, while he's often painted as a cornerstone of a genocide in this community due to inaction. And when Nancy Reagan died in 2016, there was a segment of our community who did not celebrate her life with all of the accolades that were being put out on the evening news, some which were celebrating her death instead. And I can't blame anybody for that. Meanwhile, on the ground in the US, the gay men who are, are also continuing to organize for their own health care. Um, they're trying to organize for far less than what Hudson would receive in France or what he would attempt to receive in France. Now, we noted already that we have the um, gay men's health crisis active. Well, they're doing their work, but Larry Kramer, who founded them, decided that what they're doing isn't enough and he was going to take it bigger. He decided 
to go in a different direction and gathered about 300 other people in a lower Manhattan community center to found ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. The way that they would conduct activism created its own set of ripples and brought AIDS into the national spotlight in a way that it might not otherwise have been elevated. So there's two things that ACT UP ended up doing. One branch, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about both of these. One branch was in patient advocacy and people with AIDS advocating for their own treatment. The other branch was what brought it to the evening news and how people actually saw what was going on um, in a very visceral way. Because ACT UP was not a group that you could ignore. They wouldn't let you. Um, I'm going to start just by talking about a couple of their different actions here. One of my favorite and actually their biggest first action that brought them onto the scene was October 11th, 1988. Um, they seized the FDA. And that's what they call their action. Approximately 1,500 activists from around the country descended on the FDA headquarters in Maryland to demand an accelerated process for research development and approval of drugs for treating AIDS. At this point, there was one existing drug, AZT, and it was while it may have kept people alive, the side effects were terrible enough that some people genuinely could not take it. We had folks who were going blind from this and other horrible side effects that genuinely made life miserable. Um, ACT UP called up news outlets, asked them to meet them on site in Maryland, and the protests were loud, abrasive, bold, and they demanded access to treatments that were available in other countries. Think about Hudson had gone to France. Well, those are the kinds of drugs that were being demanded for approval here as well. When officials met with ACT UP protesters, they finally caved and were like, all right, fine, we'll talk to you people, whatever. Um, they found that they were well prepared. ACT UP science team had created a 40-page document outlining their demands, research, and reasoning. And this is where we have that intersection of patient advocacy, of advocacy and um, activism with our boots on the ground demonstrations. This led to another really interesting ripple. Anthony Fauci, who no doubt you all have heard of thanks to the COVID, um, crisis here, uh, thanks to the COVID pandemic. Uh, this was really where he got his start on handling pandemics. And he would tell his colleagues um, over the years not to discount the experience of activists just because they weren't traditionally trained scientists. He would take ACT UP's work to heart. Um, he ended up adding HIV positive people and people with AIDS um, to various research uh, boards and oversight committees within the various health institutes at the national level. They ended up changing how clinical trials were done due to the work of ACT UP and their active patient advocates. Um, and it was all because he decided to take a moment to listen. The treatment and data group uh, from um, ACT UP would be essentially partners in this, even if they were often at odds. Um, we would have people who would be outside protesting and then the next day they would be sitting down with um, with Dr. Fauci to hash out what needed to happen next. And he could manage that that kind of relationship and do so positively. And the impact of the AIDS crisis on of these meetings on his career is something that he has said changed his life. And he said it as recently as the past few years, calling Larry Kramer, who oftentimes cursed him out in public, his friend on Kramer's death um, in, I believe, 2020. So... Um, very interesting ripple forward that we can see the fingerprints of very clearly in the modern uh, modern day. So while the action at the FDA was ACT UP's first big um, kind of debut onto the national scene, there were several others. Uh, they protested the Catholic Church's intervention in sex education and STD prevention in New York schools with a massive demonstration outside and inside St. Patrick's Church in 89. Um, there were a number of die-ins and other um, smaller actions as well, several large ones. Uh, their Silent Equals Death poster is probably one of the most well-known um, like textual artifacts to come out of this uh, crisis. Uh, if you want to learn more specifically about them, the documentaries United in Anger and How to Survive a Plague are both amazing. <laughs> so if you're sensitive, that might be the one to start with. How to Survive a Plague is um, a gut punch, but it is beautifully done. So I mentioned that I would go uh, look at a couple different branches here. Um, another branch of their activism that they did was called a political funeral. They staged their first one in 1992. And these were done because members requested that their deaths be used as statements, not just um, as a social issue, but as a political issue. 
the first person whose body was used this way, Mark Lowe Fisher, wrote, I want my death to be a strong statement as my life continues to be. I want my own funeral to be fierce and defiant to make the public statement that my death from AIDS is a form of political assassination. We are taking this action out of love and rage. Bury me furiously. Um, in this letter in which he wrote it, um, he did say that he saw that people didn't believe AIDS was um, really as big as it was, that it wasn't a health crisis, um, and that he wanted to note, yes, it's a health crisis, but it's also a political crisis. And he requested that his friends carry out this idea from deceased artist um, David Wynarowitz, uh, I think I pronounced his name right, um, to make an impact. Uh, Wynarowitz had said that it would be a huge um, visual impact and political impact if every time someone died of AIDS, their community sped their vehicle to the White House and dumped their body on the front steps just to show what the inaction of the government created. And so in 1992, after Fisher died, his friends held a church funeral and then marched his casket to the headquarters of the New York Republican Party on the eve of the 1992 presidential election. Bob Rafsky, himself a person with AIDS, eulogized Fisher. I'm not going to read his entire speech. Um, it is available online, and I will. I have several links and sources of this. I will be dropping in Discord, um, or you can message me uh, afterward um, if you want uh, uh, access to these. But um, Rafsky said, "This, this is this is something that I'm gonna. There's a reason I'm reading these, and we'll get to it in a minute." He said, "George Bush, we believe you'll be defeated tomorrow because we believe there's still justice left in the universe and some compassion left in the American people." But whether or not you are, here and now, standing by Mark's body, we put this curse on you. Mark's spirit will haunt you until the end of your days, so that in the moment of your defeat, you'll remember our defeats. And in the moment of your death, you'll remember our deaths. Now, the ripple to this, and I shivers here. I don't know if I believe in curses, but George Bush died on the eve of World AIDS Day in 2018. And I couldn't help but shudder when I heard the news, knowing what Rafsky said. To me, I don't know what happened there in that moment, but there's a ripple there that came out, some energies in the universe. It makes me question just what's out there. So, ACT UP brings AIDS into the public discourse. Their biggest ripple though was probably not even all of this public visibility. It may be the science club, the group of people sitting on their treatment and data committee. They would gather weekly at the apartment of member Mark Harrington, who, though he had no background in science or training of any of its fields, would win a MacArthur Genius Grant for his work on AIDS. At these gatherings, attendees would focus on a single problem and then assign themselves textbooks in immunology and virology so they could understand it and break it down and figure out how to solve it. They were methodical and dedicated, and it was the work of this group that created that 40-page policy document they presented to the FDA officials at the CC FDA event in 88. The Science Club took the stance that these actions were missing a component, that there was value in the anger being allied with expertise. So Harrington, Staley, other members of the Science Club not only learned the science behind the disease, but they also learned all of the bureaucratic rules and arcane regulations and structures of the FDA and the National Institute for Health better than even most of the people who worked there. Uh, one article in the New Yorker notes, and I quote, uh, they prepared a detailed assessment of NIH sponsored clinical trials and argued that people facing almost certain death should have access to experimental drugs that had been shown to be reasonably safe, even if they had not yet demonstrated efficacy. By 1990, the FDA had adopted this approach known as the parallel track, which would make selected drugs available to HIV positive patients. The slogan drugs into bodies moved from placards to policy. ACT UP had forced a fundamental change in the way clinical trials are conducted in the United States. Today, drug candidates for life-saving conditions are frequently put on parallel track for expanded access. So expanded access process and the way that drugs uh, were accelerated through can actually um, be traced more to the present as well, not just as to what's done in clinical trials, but this is the foundations for fast-tracking drugs that led to fast-tracking COVID vaccines when it was declared an emergency. This is one of the most concrete places that I could lay a pin down and say, this is the ripple. This is what changed the world for the better in this crisis. 
And when you're talking about a disease that was at one point pretty much a death sentence at diagnosis, it is really hard to find a bright spot and a ripple. But this particular process and these particular activists are probably the biggest point where I can say that right there is the direct line draw. It is important for me to emphasize that these were not scientists who led this effort. For the most part, by, um, they were just people with AIDS. They knew that they were fighting for their own lives. Uh, the same, they had the same sense of urgency to do so uh, for the people who were out doing die-ins in front of the FDA. In fact, Mark Harrington was a part of one of those uh, actions. Peter Staley was another. I believe he was actually the one who had the idea to drape a giant condom over Senator Jesse Helms's home to prevent uh, the infection of his words um, and of his homophobia. So these were people who were also on the ground in other ways. But they also took the approach that the expertise when married to these actions could drive forward change faster. And eventually the treatment action group split off from ACT UP to form its own organization. And the treatment action group is still going today and still advocating um, for uh, patient rights and patient advocacy and for the voices of people living with these diseases to be front and center in um, treatment courses. Another way that I kind of saw this happening in the present was when people were not believing what long COVID was doing to folks and long COVID, um, those people who were dealing with long COVID started to organize and advocate for themselves in the same way that the treatment and data group had started to do um, and to gain the, uh, the eyes of scientists and the ears of scientists in the same way that the treatment action group would ally themselves uh, later on. So it's very interesting. Again, we're seeing another trickle forward as to what was established here during the AIDS crisis is a pattern that worked and a pattern that was then followed when another group of vulnerable people needed help. Another group that took a very different approach to activism and education was the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Um, yes, they are mocking nuns. They have a lot of fun doing it. They actually started before the AIDS crisis as a lighthearted performance art and charitable organization that mocked the church with a campy flair that definitely caught attention. They chased hateful preachers out of gay San Francisco neighborhoods. They put on fundraisers and benefits and their way of taking on this world with this flamboyant joy spread to other cities. When the AIDS crisis hit, they actually produced what they claim is the world's first um, sex positive sex education pamphlet. They also created the first fundraiser benefits for an AIDS organization. That was a dog show on Castro Street. Um, and as this disease spread, uh, those of the sisters who were medical professionals started to build up on that, that idea. They, they're the ones that published a safe sex pamphlet. They started to do more education work um, and offered practical advice and humor along the way. Um, they ran through their first printing of that uh, flyer within a few months, and then they had to have a second run. They also orchestrated the first AIDS candlelight visual in 1983, and they have never lost their love of flamboyant costumes, campy names, and bold activism and demonstrations. They're still out there. They, um, through fundraisers, actually, that got the AIDS quilt off the ground, which we'll talk about the quilt in a minute as another piece of ripple forward um, effect of the crisis that anchors it to the present. Um, and they are still out there trying to do good, spread joy, foster hope, and be creative while protesting in every bit of their campy glory. The three sisters on screen actually have tame costumes compared to some of the ones I've seen. And several of the names that these, uh, that these individuals take on are not safe for work. The, the sisters have fun names. Um, but yes, they are definitely, uh, they have an attitude about them that could have only grown out of San Francisco in the late 70s. Um, would they have grown the way they did without the need for intense activism in the 80s and 90s through the crisis? I don't know. But their sense of play and fun and the way that they have stayed strong throughout is definitely a ripple on particularly the San Francisco community, but all of their worldwide chapters as well. That seems to have stemmed from the urgency of needing to keep some sort of play in activism during that time. So it really is interesting to see here how we have a culture where sex ed was largely based on fear. And we have these folks, clearly not afraid of anything, who step up and decide to put a irreverent, lighthearted pamphlet forward that says, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to um, avoid people 
entirely who have AIDS, you can still go out and live your lives. Um, so it was a very interesting, um, interesting dichotomy here going on. And it's one more ripple, um, one more ripple that uh, moved forward. And their funding of the AIDS quilt is something that um, we're going to kind of jump to next because they daisy chain into why we have the quilt. So this picture here is, uh, I believe, from the 1992 display of the quilt. It was a very visible community art project that showed the scale of the crisis itself, um, even if this was truly only a sliver of it. The names project that, that created it began with nothing more than paper placards. Activist, author, and lecturer Cleve Jones had organized a memorial march for San Francisco supervisor Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone every year since their assassinations in 1978. While he was planning the 1985 march, he learned that over 1,000 people in San Francisco had been lost to AIDS at that point. He asked fellow marchers to write names of people they'd lost on placards, and at the end of the march, they taped those to the walls of the San Francisco Federal Building. The wall of names looked like a quilt, and the idea was born right there and then. A little more than a year later, a small group of people gathered together to try to document the lives of those lost to AIDS, fearing that history would forget them. And this was the foundation of the Names Project and the AIDS Memorial Quilt. Cleve made his first quilt panel in honor of his friend Marvin Feldman. In 1987, people began sending panels in. On October 11, 87, it was displayed for the first time on the National Mall and was already larger than a football field. It consisted of 1,920 panels, each representing a person lost to AIDS, and panels are three foot by six foot the size of a grave. All of those names were read aloud. And the project kept growing. In 1988, one year later, 8,288 panels. 1989, more than 12,000 panels. And in 1992, it was displayed on the National Mall in, in full and consisted of panels from every state and 28 countries. It's considered the largest community art project in history. Each handmade panel representing at least one person. At present, it is a 54-ton tapestry, including nearly 50,000 panels dedicated to more than 110,000 individuals. Um, it can no longer be displayed in its entirety due to its size. It is fully documented and available online. You can go and actually see the quilt on the website as a continually living testament to the impact of AIDS on the world. And it is still accepting additional panels to this day. This is another one of those points where I can say this is a direct line. This is a direct ripple um, of how this has affected our community at present. We can see that this is still growing. But it's not without controversy either, despite the fact it is the largest community art project in the world. In 1992, some members of ACT UP saw the quilt as a way that the death and pain of the AIDS crisis was being sanitized or made less ugly. They decided to take action during the display of the quilt on the National Mall. Of everything ACT UP did, this is probably the action that moves me the most emotionally. Um, they called this the Ashes Action. People linked arms and marched from the quilt to the White House lawn while carrying the ashes of the deceased loved ones taken by AIDS. When they reached the fence surrounding the White House, they dumped the ashes onto the lawn, a demonstration and reminder that the inaction of those some of those lauding the quilt, those who worked in the government, who were walking amongst the panels and saying how much of an impact it had, some of those people were the ones whose inaction had led to the deaths of so many. I do have an episode, uh, a clip from an episode here uh, from AIDS Community Television, which was produced by ACT UP member James Wensey, and uh, we're going to watch that next. It's just a couple minutes, but it really gives you the idea of the ashes action. Um, if it makes you misty, don't feel bad. It will make me misty too. Um, but it's really probably the biggest way that I can show the parallels um, between these two um, activism tracks and what this meant. And again, that it still has this impact, that it's been documented, that it's out there is another piece of how this thing is rippling forward. The quilt makes our dying look beautiful, but it's not beautiful. It's ugly, and we have to fight for our lives. 
the impact of these videos, these documents, the stories, that's the biggest ripple. The fact that I can do these and still be moved and still be misty at the end of a presentation when I have seen that video dozens of times, that I can still be inspired by the act of the treatment actions of the treatment action group, that I can still look at Larry Kramer and say, I want to know how he did it, how he kept that energy, because I want that too. This is what I want to help keep moving forward. Our ripple to the present is the legacy of defiance. We have seen as a community mass death, even if those of us who are too young to actually know of it or whatnot, this is the history. This is the community that has seen grief. This is the community that has seen government inaction and indifference and named it a genocide. A community that has recognized the patterns of a plague and shut down pride, not wanting to see it all happen again. We will see people who don't trust their elected officials and they don't trust that they will ever keep promises to our community because if they couldn't then, they won't now. We'll see people who won't believe that these institutions will ever help them. We'll see people who will doubt that we, as parts of some of those institutions, will be able to help them. And that's valid. I want us to all remember that because we are the helpers and we can help keeping help keep it from happening again. And maybe, just maybe, if we can shoulder this and bring this cultural memory to the next generation, we can raise up a generation of young people who will look back on our elders with compassion, understanding, care, and determination to keep fighting back just like they did. I'm going to leave here a little bit, a few minutes for any conversation if you'd like to, but I want to wrap up with one last ripple. This is going to come back again to Mark Low Fisher's political funeral and Bob Rafsky. Now, Rafsky, if you'll remember, is the gentleman that I, uh, I quoted um, who cursed Bush. He's also the gentleman that you heard in that last video shouting that the quilt makes their dying look beautiful and it's not, it's ugly. You got to hear his own voice there for a little bit. Um, he died actually not long after the action in 1992. But he also said at the very end of his uh, eulogy for Fisher, something that has been my little personal ripple that I cannot get out of my head and I have quoted since I first heard it over and over again. In anger and in grief, this fight is not over till all of us are safe. So thank you all of you for taking the time today to shoulder this heavy slice of history with me and to look for these ripples as we move forward. I want you to go with this knowledge, community knowledge behind you, be the ripple forward with it. And despite all of the hard stuff, take some time to find your joy. I'm gonna stop share now. And if there's anybody who would like to have any bit of conversation, um, I'm happy to do so. Um, yep, I see that someone did note um, the uh, Uncle Jim's book. Ah, my beloved, Backdrop is making it hard to see, but yes, um, I do warn you if you do want to find Jim's book, um, it is beautiful, but it has his photography and he did not, he was a gay man doing leather, leather photography in the 70s. It's explicit. Um, you will see picture of male genitals. It is not always clean and dandy, but it is such an important piece of history. Um, so I am very, um, I very much love um this particular book and I do recommend it uh, so long as you don't mind a gay man very bluntly telling about his experiences and his artwork. So thanks all. Um, I know that Danny had to jet off so I'm doing my own closing. Oh, gasp. Um, but uh, you're welcome to stick around for the next few minutes if you need to. Uh, if you need to jet off because you are headed to the next session. Um, that's fantastic as well. I will see you there uh, in um, the session hosted by the champion group talking about what our lgbtq affirming programs can look like um i do not immediately have the link to that on hand but you can find it in the program um the blue titles are links so click on those if you need to find that or you can find it in discord <laughs>